So Romans 6, I want to talk to you today is, are we free to sin? As we look at this new year and go to, are you free to sin? You see, a lot of times Christians, I hear people talk like this. I know that God won't throw me out of his family if I sin, so I don't need to live a holy life. I can just kind of go on about my business. Or some people may say, well, since God will always forgive me when I ask him to, then sin is no big deal for me. I don't take it that serious. Or some say, since salvation isn't based on my obedience to God's commandments, I'm free to break those commandments. So I don't know what camp you fall into, but a lot of times those are some of the arguments that sometimes we even have in our mind. You know, when I was a young person, I just thought that growing up in the church, I just felt that um, I was a Catholic boy, I, and, and, and I grew up wanting to honor the Lord in my life, being a Catholic, and, and I just felt that if I did something wrong, this giant thumb was going to come down and squish me. And then when I got to about junior high and I did something wrong, you know, that disobeyed my parents or lied, the thumb didn't come down. And I thought, what? You know, the bolt of lightning didn't strike. And I thought, what the heck? I, you know, and so I just thought, well, I'll try something else and see if the lightning bolt comes and hits me, and it didn't. And so little by little, I just started to do things that were wrong in my life, and I started pursuing, instead of holiness and God in my life, I started pursuing other things that I was trying to find satisfaction. Luckily, by the time I, it was only a short phase, and by the time I was in high school, the first year, my, my uh, freshman year at the end of that, I was introduced to Christ by someone on, a, on, a, on the football team, and he was the quarterback of the football team, and he led me to Christ, and I've followed him ever since. It hasn't always been right. I've backslid. I've made mistakes. I've made wrong choices, but praise God, by his grace, I've made a lot more right choices than wrong choices, and the same with all of us. We need to really come to a place, are we, are we really free to sin? Um, in Romans 6, starting with verse 15, I believe that it really helps us kind of answer this, this issue of sin. It says, what then shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? You see, Paul had just got done saying in verse 14, you're not under law, but we're under grace. And that means we can't earn our salvation by obeying God's law. I want you to hear this that you can't earn your salvation by obeying God's law. We receive that, our salvation, through his grace. It's a gift. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. But then verse 15 says on, but since my obedience, in verse 15, since my obedience has nothing to do with my salvation, does it mean I'm free to sin? I can just live my life the way I want to live. I can just go on about doing my business. And then Paul answers, by no means, or no way, or how foolish. You know, why? Why is that? Well, I believe is that Paul gives us reasons in Romans, the rest of this chapter is why we are not free to sin. I believe the first reason, I'm going to give three of them, why we are not Uh, free to sin is that first is that sin enslaves us in Romans in in verse 16 it says don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as a slave you are a slave to the one whom you obey you see many of you go through life and you don't think that you are enslaved to anybody I'm my own person but verse 16 teaches us that everyone is a slave God wired us that way. No one can resist serving a master. The key in life is not finding freedom from all the masters, but submitting to the right master in our life. And I want you to just look at the word obey. In fact, it it says that in our verse, two times in the 16th verse, Paul says about obey. You must obey your master, but the one you obey is your master to discover your master is and you just have to think yourself who am i I obeying if you look at your life who are you obeying in your life and your life will show it some people serve their careers they're workaholics 
They say that their jobs is their top priority in their life, and they put it over God, over their families. And uh, millions of people, all of a sudden, that becomes their master. Others are slaves to public opinion. They compromise their moral standards rather than to say no to peer. They're under peer pressure of their friends of what really their, their choices are. So all of a sudden, they're a slave to their peers because they don't want to stand out any different than what their peers say. Many politicians, for the sake of votes, will put their personal convictions aside when the majority of Americans disagree with them. They're slave to others' opinions and to their political party. A lot of times they choose against even what their own moral mind will make to save their career as a politician. Maybe you claim to be a servant of the Lord, but does your obedience back up your claim? It's not what you say, it's not what I say, but it's whom I obey that tells me who my master is. Who's your master? In the end, in the final analysis, we can only have one or two masters. It's the devil or God. It all boils down to those two. Whether you're a slave to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness, there is no third alternative. When we become a Christian, we transfer our loyalty from Satan to Jesus. When someone becomes a criminal and they get into the system, into the prison system, the authorities tell them, and they have to serve, basically there's actually two laws that they serve. One is that the inmates themselves have their own laws. The other is that the prison has their own laws. And they're told when to wake up, when to go to sleep, when they can do this, when they can do that. When they're, when all the rules that are made for them are made for them when they're in the prison. But as soon as they come back in society, they find themselves under new laws. Don't drive over the speed limit. Don't go through a red light. Don't steal. Don't kill. Pay your taxes. The criminal's freedom from prison merely puts him under a new set of laws. When he was in prison, he was forced to obey it. But now that when he gains his freedom, he's free to obey. But whether in prison or out in society, he has a duty to obey. Unfortunately, we don't get it. <laughs> we just don't get that because we think that I'm free. I can make my own decisions. I'm my own man. I'm my own being. And it's really a lie, I believe, that Satan puts us under. When we realize that we have to submit to some kind of authority, it, it, it's like this. It's like if I had a, a goldfish bowl right here and there's a goldfish swimming around and he's looking at all those people. Now, in this goldfish tank, he's free to roam and do all the little flips and go through all the little things in that fish bowl. But he looks out and he sees all you people and he says, man, I want to be free. And so he musters all the strength he can be and he tries it. But he, and then one day he finally gets up and he gets out and he gets free. He goes, I'm free. I'm out. And then he dies. <laughs> You know, but while he was in that fish tank in the law, he was in those laws, he was free to do whatever he wanted. He had boundaries in which he lived in. We all have boundaries in which we have to live in. And it's which boundaries are you setting in your life to live under? Who is it that you're enslaved to? You see, verse, um, there's, there's no such thing as absolute freedom. Verse 17 reminds us, says, you used to be slaves to sin. And I love how it uses the past tense. You used to be slave to sin. When we were slave to sin, uh, we were slaves to that master. But now we have a new master, Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, Paul spoke of people who were, who were of these people. And he's talking to the people that were going to the church. He was, in a sense, talking to you and I. In 1 Corinthians 6, he says, you know, uh, spoke of the people who were adulterers, prostitutes, homosexual, thieves, and liars, and drunkards. And then he added in verse 11, and that was what some of you were. And he goes, Again, I want you to notice the passage. That's what some of you were. 
but we're no longer in that category because when we start believing in Christ, we're not slave to those past sins anymore, the past tense. We live in a new relationship because sin and the Satan is not our master. Jesus now is our new master. How did we make that change? In Romans six seventeen, he says, you were wholeheartedly obeyed from the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. Are you being a half-hearted Christian? What are you wholeheartedly going after as that verse really claims us to be? What are you wholeheartedly entrusting in? So many times we as Christians don't really wholeheartedly go after our relationship to God. We put it in a mix of other things we're doing and we're letting it be a part of our life, but we don't wholeheartedly put it as the master of our life. But I believe that God wants all of our hearts. He wants all of our soul. He wants all of your mind. He wants all of your emotions. He wants all of your strength. It says that the commandment he gave, love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And a lot of times we don't. A lot of times we just give him portions that are convenient to us at that moment. And you might say, well, wait a minute. Isn't faith in Christ the condition of salvation? So what's all this talk about obedience? And I would say, yes, faith alone is a condition of salvation. But here's the key. The result of our faith in Christ is that we prove it by our obedience. Your obedience is to the master in which you can see what your, what your faith is all about. In Romans 6, 18, it says, you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. No sooner are we set free from sin than when we became slaves of righteousness. There's no neutral ground between the two conditions. I remember years ago, Bob Dylan, who was kind of like a folk rock hero back in the day, he wrote a song, You've Got to Serve Somebody After He Got Saved. And I thought it was pretty good insight from a guy who came from kind of the rock and roll era and became a Christian. But he says, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you've got to serve somebody. Who are you serving? Who's your somebody that you're serving? Romans 6, 19 says, just as you used to offer parts of, your, parts of your body to slavery, to impurity, and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer them to slavery, to righteousness, leading to holiness. Note there, ever-increasing wickedness. Some of you may think, well, I just may be able to get by it this one time, so I'll choose to do my own thing and I'll choose to sin. If I just do this little part, then it's okay. But I want you to realize today, and especially our young people, is that sin is a living organism and that it grows every day. The longer we obey it, the more it enslaves us. No one ever goes into taking that first drink to end up an alcoholic, going to all the abuse and all those other things that they have to go through. If they knew that they were going to get into that in the beginning, they would have never started it. The road to prostitution, if they knew that that was going to lead, whatever that was that started them out, that lead to the life that they led, they probably would have never started out that way. What fool would? Well, all of us, when we become a fool to Satan, because he leads us astray by telling us lies, and we believe those lies. It's a, sin is a living organism, and it never starts out how it ends. And that's why so much I believe that Paul, or Paul wrote, and in, in, in Jesus gave us the scriptures, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all righteousness all unrighteous because as soon as I sin as soon as I blew it as soon as I realize that I'm doing wrong I can go to my father and say father forgive I don't have to continue in that and letting it keep leading me down that road because we are going to have those times we are all going to stumble and fall we all are going to make mistakes and, and times and the minute we realize that we can go and just say father forgive me and I truly, truly am repentant. I don't want to live that way. I want to be righteous. I want to be holy. I don't want any part of that sin nature that, 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 that's there that's creeping at my door that, that's there as Paul writes. It wants to entangle me into the sin. And, and when I get tangled up and it just gets worse, it feels like an octopus that gets all around me and sucks me into its grip. 
I don't want that. And so some of you may be here and you may be dabbling in some areas of your life that is sin. And I want to encourage you that get away from it. Confess this sin. Go to the Father and say, Father, I realize it. I I need those chains off of me. Because sin is only going to put you in bondage in the chains. And it's going to suck you into into an area that you just don't want to go. And you'll look back someday and you'll say, how in the hell did I get there? Because it's hell that got you there. The second reason why we are free, not free to sin is that sin shames us. In 6.20 it says now, it says this, that we were, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. Sometimes I shudder looking at this verse. If you really look at it, to be free from the control of righteousness is to be out of control. And when you don't have the boundaries of righteousness in your life and you put those boundaries in, then you're out of control. And it really grieves my heart when you see the, the beer commercials and the college students, oh, man, let's party. And, you know, it's Easter break and we're going to go down and do all this stuff. Well, rarely until you watch cops do you see what happens at the end of a lot of those parties. You know, they're being drug off to rehab and you see all the, you know, all the people passed out and dying on, you know, dying because they're there having said, it's such a lie. And if we don't put those boundaries in our life and there's things that go on in our lives that we do that put so much shame on us because of the sin that we do. There was a pastor that we all know, and I'm not going to say the name, but there was so much shame because he committed adultery that he took his own life and destroyed the church and his family and the church family. He couldn't live with the sin and the shame that he had because he, he blew it. And so many times we get caught up into a sin, and I'm sure it's something that started innocent that went into something that wasn't innocent anymore. But if we allow ourselves not to, not, if, we, if we don't put boundaries in our life, then it's so easy we get tripped up, and Satan wants to trip us up. He wants us to fall. He wants us to bear a shame unto our lives that we can't bear looking looking at ourselves, and we'd rather just take our lives than have to deal with that shame. And that is such a lie from hell. Because when we're able to come to the cross, even as a Christians, when we blow it, we're able to go to him and he cleanses us and purifies us and reestablishes us and reappoints us and enables us to give us a second and a third chance in our lives. Sin wants to destroy you, but the cross of Christ wants to give you a second chance. And so it's a warning of, that's why we're not free to sin as Christians, because the shame that it does to us, it just destroys us. In verse 21, it says, what benefit did you reap at the time from those things that you are now ashamed of? The benefit means, truly, it means just the fruit in the original Greek. What fruit is it then that you reap at those times and that you're ashamed of? You know, Matthew, uh, Jesus gave us the same kind of warning about our fruit in Matthew uh, seven sixteen and 20. He says, you'll know them by their fruit that they bear. And many times in our lives, and sometimes, it, you know, we can hide a lot of things. But your life and the fruit that you bear in your life will a lot of times tell, really, who is the master of your life. In Galatians five twenty two and 23, it says, but by the fruit, you will recognize them. And it talks about if you see a harvest of anger and bitterness and deceit and selfishness and rebellion against God, then you can kind of conclude that the devil is your father. But if you produce the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, 
peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, then you can be assured that your Father is the Lord of Lords. The ironic part about the benefit of a life enslaved in sin is the things that you are now ashamed of. And Philip's, he says, it blessed to remember. You think of Samson and Delia and how she was beautiful and inviting when he fell into that. It just reaped shame upon his life. Every Christian feels haunting memories of things that they once did and that they're now ashamed of. Perhaps cheating in school or sexual involvement, gambling away uh, money, aborting a baby, experimenting with drugs, driving on the influence of alcohol and causing an accident or injuring somebody. Living those conditions can bring us so much shame. And when we backslide, sometimes we can fall and come that shame comes on us. But we don't have to stay in that failing part of shame because God brings us out of that. And we need to see who we are in Christ. Those who are living in Christ can come out of that shame and disappointment because that's our old nature and that's our old carnal nature. And again, we have a way that we can come out of those kind of things. And when we do, we find ourselves realizing that I don't want shame to be part of my life. For the young people, warning. Don't allow yourself to get tripped up in those things. You can choose not to. The third point of why we don't want to be live in sin is that sin destroys us. In verse 21, it says, sin's Sin brings death to our fellowship. The, the, the things that result in death, sin brings death to our fellowship with God, death to our prayer life, death to our hunger in Scripture, death to our joy, death to our peace. We go through life with no relationship with Christ, and then sin ultimately leads us to death and everlasting in hell. Sin and spiritual death are not for those who become and receive the new life in Christ. Next verse in 22 says that, but now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you re reap leads to holiness. The result is eternal life. Now it's saying, but now, in contrast to, and at that time, but now, you're not of that time anymore, but now, your benefit is that you reap the things of Christ, his holiness, his eternal life. You reap now his character in your life. You become now a slave to his righteousness. Christians should always be growing in holiness. If we're not growing in holiness, then I would say that we start seeing ourselves falling to the temptations of the past. And then it warns us in 623, for the wages of sin is death. As Christians, we, before we knew Christ, we deserved death. But in Christ, that the wages that we earned, that it was right where we we're heading for. But in Christ, he gave us a new uh, living wage of eternal life. Ezekiel 3.11 says this. 33.11, it says this. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they will turn from their ways and live. Turn. Turn from your evil ways. Turn from your evil ways. We don't have to die for our sins because Jesus died for them 2,000 years ago. And verse 23 sounds that alarm for the wages of sin is death, and it goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life in our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the greatest part to put our hope in is that we, our hope, our life is in Christ. In Deuteronomy 30, 19, it says this, I call the heaven and earth as a witness against you that I have set before your life and death, blessing and curses. Now choose life so that you may live. Choose life, I want to encourage you as a church in this new year. 
Don't choose death. Choose life. Choose to do things that put things of righteousness and holiness in your life. Let the Holy Spirit take time of, of looking through your life and the spotlight showing in your life that, that the Holy Spirit will show you areas of your life that you need to do to be able to bring righteousness and holiness into your life. Are we free to sin? No more than we are free to jump out a third story window. Don't lose your freedom and become slaves to the laws that bring death. But claim to be free from sin. Free to be able to choose to follow after holiness and righteousness in your life. Free to be able to listen to the Holy Spirit that gnaws on you and tells you the right things to do. If the Holy Spirit is whispering that in your life, then man, listen to it and step through it. Don't put off doing the right thing. It's not hard doing the right. All you need to do is say, Lord, what is the right thing to do here? And the Lord will show you. You just got to listen to it. The Holy Spirit says that he's there to, to, to walk you through. He aids you through. He's there to, to, to be an aid to live this life and to empower you to do it. But you've got to choose to do those right things in your life. I can't make you do that. No one can make you do that. The wife or husband, you can't make yourselves do it. It has to be you freely saying, Lord, I choose to be a slave to your righteousness, to your word. I choose to be a slave to you, Father, so that in my freedom, I give it over to you. Put me in that fishbowl. And help me to be satisfied in that. Even though I may see things that look so inviting out here. Help me not to go there, Lord. There was a, a woman whose husband was in, in, a, uh, in prison and he did a sentence. And then they put him in one of the emotional disturbed places and she fought the courts to get him back and get him back and so finally they they released because they said Are you sure we don't feel like he can adjust to society she just said no matter what he wanted her husband back and because the only life she knew was a life to be with him and uh and and so she wanted him back and so they released him and uh three weeks later he killed her and the two children you see, what she knew, she was familiar with, and she wanted it so bad, even though it wasn't the right choice to make. And in her heart, she didn't have the, the ability to be able to choose the right thing to do in her life. You know, the Holy Spirit is in our life to tell us the right things to do, but so many times we don't listen to that. You see, the, the officials in the court was trying to say, no, 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 this guy is not good. And we don't want to release them. But she fought it and she fought it and she fought it. So many times we fight things in our life to get them back into our lives. And we allow ourselves to go out of that fishbowl into something that looks a whole lot more entertaining out here. And we end up tripping and falling. And all of a sudden now we have to deal with shame because of the sin in our lives. But thanks be to God. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I live by that. I, I, I memorize it. I, you know, be wise, because I have to say it a lot in my life. Thank you, God, that your grace covers my sin, and I just go and breathe out to you my sin and breathe in forgiveness from you. Now, what does it mean to repent? Repent is, means to be sorry, truly sorry for that thing that you do. It's, it's not enough just to go easy, oh, yeah, whatever, Lord. But a true repentance to say, man, I want to make a 180-degree turn and walk away from that action, that thing that I was doing, that habit, whatever it might be. That's true repentance. And sometimes it pulls you right back, but you're not practicing and doing it time and time again. And you make changes in your life and to the best of your ability to not fall into that same sin over and over and over again. A lot of times, folks, it's not the devil, it's you <laughs> choosing to do those things. So let's stand over to prayer. Hi, I'm Pastor John McConnell, and I'd like to welcome you today for watching our program. It's just amazing the technology we have today 
that we're able to live stream all around the world. And we'd like to give you an opportunity, if you'd like to give towards this ministry, you can go online and be able to uh, follow the directions that are on there and be able to give to the ministry that you've been watching. So God bless you. We thank you for being part of Southside Alliance Church today.